Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, I can't see anybody, so I'm going to give this a few minutes to let people time to uh, log in. Um, but I'm really excited about tonight. Um, I'm really excited to spend time talking with you about exercise and physical activity. Um, my objective for our times together is to share my passion. I actually really, really enjoy exercising. I know that's probably odd for a lot of people because most people dread it, <laughs> but I actually really like it. And so this is really a fun topic for me to do. Um, some of you may prefer not to discuss exercise, but you're here for a reason. So I hope we can learn something together. Um, so my objectives for tonight are to share my passion, um, educate the Maxwell family, um, because you are family and physical activity is foundational as far as max, uh, maximal wellness and to inspire you to get moving and to continue to be active for your entire life. It is my hope that you will make exercise a priority, like brushing your teeth. Um, the old adage of if you don't use it, you lose it is very true and applies here. First, um, some housekeeping uh, objectives here. Um, so if you can make sure you're muted um, and if the internet goes out for some reason, just hang on, don't go anywhere, and I will switch to my Wi-Fi, but I don't think that's going to happen. So um, this was a cute slide I wanted to include. And I think it's safe to say that most everybody knows that exercise is good for you. Um, you may even have heard that sitting is the new smoking. So if it's such a good thing, why doesn't everybody, as Nike says, just do it? Um, many people think about exercise as a means to an end. Usually that end um, is to lose weight or to start a new year's resolution or just to be overall healthier um, or post 2020 pandemic, um, an effort to fit back into your regular clothes since we, a lot of us have been wearing sweatpants um, on the Zoom days. Um, but it's so much more powerful than that. Um, according to uh, the Journal of American College of Cardiology, physical inactivity is one of the leading modifiable risk factors for global mortality with an estimated 20 to 30 percent increased risk of death compared to those who are physically active. That's pretty, that's a pretty shocking um, statement. Um, and there's an abundant amount of scientific evidence that demonstrates that physical act people that are physically active of all age groups and ethnicities have higher levels of cardiorespiratory fitness, health, wellness, and lower risk for developing several chronic medical illnesses, such as cardiovascular disease, um, and compared to those that are physically inactive. So the more active you are, the better, but even a little bit of exercise or even physical activity is beneficial and that's what I'm gonna show you tonight. So this is a little bit of a more serious graphic than the last one. <laughs> um, and what it's showing is that um, the more, the person who's more sedentary, who's sitting most of the time, in other words, their daily sitting time is much greater um, compared to someone who is more physically active. Um, this graphic is uh, from the Medical Journal of Lancet in 2016, and I like it because it brings home the point that it's not all about weight loss. Um, so one of my goals today is to share the information with you and empower you, empower you to have one or more tools in your, one more tool in your wellness toolbox. So let's define what we're talking about here. Physical activity, um, sorry, I need to make my slide a little better, a little bigger for me to see it. Um, physical activity is any movement that is carried out by a skeletal muscle group that requires energy to perform. So physical activity can be many things. It can be work related or chores. Um, it can include outdoor activities, playtime, 
which we as adults seem to have forgotten how to do because um, we're so busy working all the time. Um, examples would be walking the dog, cleaning the house, actively playing with your kids or grandkids, um, taking the stairs, gardening, etc. Exercise is intentional movement that is planned, structured, and repetitive that is intended to maintain or improve physical fitness. So exercise can be going to the gym, but it doesn't have to include a gym because many things can be done outside in nature or in your neighborhood or in your home, even without equipment. And the pandemic, it's been a lot of things, but one thing it has been is it's created many more online resources uh, for us to use, um, but we have to seek them out. We have to know what to look for and we have to take the initiative to explore those things. Um, but which is more important? Well, both is important here. Um, how much do you need? Well, this is the US Department of Health and Human Services um, updated their guidelines in 2008, 2018. And they, did, they pretty much said that um, to move more at, throughout the day, that's bullet point number one. Um, the second thing that they uh, recommended is moderate intensity aerobic activity defined as 150 minutes, that's about two and a half hours, or 300 minutes, about five hours a week a week of moderate intensity uh, exercise. That means you're working hard enough to raise your heart rate or break a sweat. Um, one way to tell if you're in a moderate intensity aerobic activity is that you'll be able to talk, but not sing your, the words to your favorite song. Um, and that's just kind of a good baseline. A lot of people have wearables now and they can track their heart rate and all that, but we're not getting into all that tonight. So just moderate aerobic intensity would be, you could have a conversation with someone, might be a little short of breath, but you couldn't sing all the words to the song because you don't have that much wind. Examples of moderate intensity activities would be brisk walking, aerobic, um, water aerobics, riding a bike, dancing, doubles, tennis, pushing a lawnmower, hiking, rollerblading. Vigorous activity is 75 minutes or about an hour and 15 minutes or to 150 minutes or two and a half hours approximately of more vigorous activities, meaning you couldn't really sing or even talk in full sentences. So you might be doing this kind of number where you're trying to hold a conversation, but you just, you just can't talk. Um, Examples of vigorous activity would be hiking up a hill with a heavy backpack, uh, running, swimming laps, aerobic dancing, um, heavy yard work like digging or hoeing, singles tennis, um, cycling, jumping rope. Um, those are more vigorous activities. Well, do you have to do one or the other or do you have to do both? No, it's either or, or it can be some combination of either one. Um, and so and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if you do it all in one, you know, 15 minutes a day, if that's all you've got on that day because of other requirements that you have to, other commitments you have to do, that's fine. Just do what you can on the day you can do, but collectively over a week, you wanna shoot for these goals. And they added muscle strengthening activity involving all major muscle groups uh, at least two days a week and then balance training for older adults. So are we meeting these goals? Some of you may be, some of you may not be, some of you may think this is completely overwhelming. Um, so this is a slide that shows us at least in 2010 to 2015, no would be the answer. Um, as a nation, we're not doing so great as far as movement is concerned. This graphic, I liked it because I'm a visual learner and I like the pictures. Um, it's from a CDC report. It's again, it's old report, um, but I couldn't find a more recent graphic that I wanted to share that um, had all the different states and the actual numbers on them. So I use this one, but the CDC report looked at how many adults in every state met the guidelines to achieve 150 minutes of weekly um, moderate activity and, and at least two days per week of muscle strengthening activities. And nationally, the data shows that 
we hit about 22.9% um, of folks met the goals, but individual states varied. And as you can see in the South, not so proud. Um, out West, Colorado, um, do a little bit better. So what about the kids? Because it's not just adults. These were adults. This was age, I think, 18 to 65. Um, but what about, what about kids? Um, I thought this was kind of a fun, a fun little graphic. Um, so the guidelines for children um, and teens, so this is like ages six to 18. Um, the guidelines are there as well in that same report that came out in 2018. Um, but in our very tech savvy world, most US kids fall woefully short in all age groups. Um, the, in 2018, the United States report card on physical activity for children and youth as evaluated by the National Physical Activity Plan Alliance team of experts score for overall activity rating for our kids is a D minus. Now that doesn't apply to everybody. It was averages, um, but the bottom line is we live in a very different life than our ancestors did. Um, we live in a land of convenience. Um, I'm personally grateful not to have to grow my own food like my grandmother did. Um, and, um, but things have become so convenient these days that um, we don't even have to go to the grocery store. We can, you know, do a something, an app um, and have, have it just delivered. And we don't even really have to cook. We can Uber Eats or we can delivery dudes and food just appears at our house. Um, so uh, this, this was really more about kids, but everything has been sort of made convenient. And I really like convenience. I'm not against convenience, but I think that's kind of working against us. And I think that in this pandemic that we're still in, um, it's really um, changed a lot of people's exercise activities. Some people I have heard are doing more and that's awesome. Some people have slipped up and are not doing as much. They can't go to the gyms. They can't get out as much. Um, so, and that's affected our kids. They're not going to school. Well, some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, so it's really been pretty impactful as far as physical activity is concerned. So what are the benefits of physical activity? Um, the first one's kind of a no brainer. And I'm gonna go through some of these faster than others, but. Uh, We'll take questions at the end. Um, weight loss is pretty obvious, but as a general rule of thumb, um, it's got to be paired with diet. People get very frustrated because they get all fired up and they get gun home. Like, I'm going to start running. I'm going to do all these things and they don't lose any weight. Why? Why is that? Well, it could be that your diet didn't change because that really has to pair with everybody's a little different, but it really has to pair. It's about 80% diet and 20% activity. Um, but as a rule of thumb, you need to burn about 3,500 calories to lose one pound of fat or more simply put lo to lose a pound a week. That's about 500 calories that need to go missing each day, whether that's through diet or through burning them off with exercise. And this can be accomplished in many ways. It's best to combine diet and exercise um, as far as that's concerned. Um, improve strength and endurance. That's obvious. Um, improves cardiovascular fitness. Most people, when they think of exercise, they think of cardiovascular health and it's good for your heart. Your heart is a muscle. And so you work that muscle with aerobic activity and you're gonna have better cardiovascular fitness. Um, reduces stress, anxiety, and depression. Randomized controlled trials of many studies comparing exercise to antidepressants reported that exercise and anti low dose antidepressants were equally as effective. And when you paired the two, there was even bigger benefits um, and improved sleep. I've had lots of uh, patients tell me that, oh, my sleep is improved. And I'll say, well, what changed? Well, I started exercising, um, but it's also in the literature. Improves cognitive function. Uh, Aerobic exercise increases something called BDNF, which is an acronym for brain-derived neutrotrophic factor in the brain. 
um, and this is responsible for enhancing cellular metabolic activity of the brain and it increases neuroplasticity. Um, and this is not just true in folks that are older, it's true in younger kids. There was a study, I think out of Ireland, um, I can't tell you where I read this, but where they, they took a group of young males who were pretty much sedentary and they took this memory test of just matching things. And then they took half of that group and exercised them to almost exhaustion for like 30 minutes on stationary bikes. The other graph, the other half, they just let them sit there. And then they both sets, both groups retook the the test on memory. Uh, and this would be a short-term memory test. And these were young gentlemen, they weren't older, um, like in their twenties. And the exercise group performed higher and got more correct answers than the sedentary group in that one trial. So there's lots of studies like that. So it does improve cognitive function for all age groups. Um, improves fatigue. And some people are like, well, I'm tired. I don't want to exercise. How's that going to help me out? You'd be surprised. Now, if you try to exercise and you are extremely fatigued or you just can't, you don't have enough energy to do that, I encourage you to talk to your provider. There may be some nutrient deficiencies. There may be some mitochondrial issues. There's a lot to dig into there. Um, but for the most part, uh, it does improve uh, fatigue. Um, improves bowel function, reduces constipation. I mean, think about it. You take your dog on a walk, he poops. Um, same thing for humans. The more you move, the less stopped up you get. Uh, it improves overall um, bowel function. Uh, reduces blood pressure. Um, about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise a week, which works out to be about 30 minutes a day, depending on how you, how you do that, if you do most days a week, can lower systolic blood pressure five to nine degree uh, millimeters of mercury. Uh, reduction of blood sugar uh, and improves insulin sensitivity. And this is a big one because higher levels of insulin, insulin in the body um, create lots and lots of inflammation and that's really, really bad for the brain and brain health. Um, so it improves the sens sensitivity of uh, insulin as well as uh, reducing blood sugar. It lowers cardiovascular disease mortality, um, decreasing risk of atrial fibrillation, decreases uh, congestive heart failure, um, cardiovascular events. Um, it's pretty, uh, well known, but wanted to mention it here, lowers the adverse uh, lipid profile. Um, that's mostly in increasing the HDL, it can also help lower the LDL. Um, lowers the risk of diabetes, and that kind of goes with the blood sugar and insulin sensitivity. Um, reduces the risk of falls related injury for older adults. Well, if you're practicing balancing exercises, you're going to stay upright more likely if you have more muscle, you know, twitch, you know, slow twitch fibers or fast twitch fibers, which we do lose as we age. It's going to um, help you uh, uh, improve if you're starting to go down to be able to catch yourself. Um, it improves quality of life. Um, you can do more things if you feel like doing it, being more active. Um, and that's important. It improves bone health, lowers the risk of osteoporosis. Um, bones are at their maximum strength and density somewhere between the ages of 25 to 30. Um, so we really want our kids exercising and moving and being active because they're building um, muscle strength, which is also building bone health. Um, and so the more you build, the more you can hang on to. Um, and that is able to be maintained if you're actually uh, doing those weight bearing exercises. Reduce the risk of dementia. We already talked about cognitive function, but there have been studies, uh, lots of studies that look at exercise with dementia. Uh, improves function and reduces pain in patients with arthritis. 
that's most people say, oh, I can't exercise because I've got bad knees. I have arthritis. Um, actually, if you improve your um, muscle strengths around those joints, it actually is beneficial. And there have been studies that show that for osteoarthritis and even rheumatoid arthritis, I have several patients with rheumatoid arthritis, they go to physical therapy, they're actually to be, they're able to be more mobile and have decreased pain with very targeted, supervised exercise programs. Um, that's, that's huge. Um, improves immune function. Oops, I went one, one slide too far over here. Hold on. Sorry, I have two screens and so I'm, that's why I'm looking over here to, to be able to be on the same slide as you are. Um, reduces symptoms of PMS and menopause, less hot flashes, less irritability. Everybody is up for that. Um, for pregnant women who it reduces excessive weight gain, postpartum depression and gestational diabetes. Now you obviously need to follow guidelines in regards to exercising with pregnant uh, as you're pregnant and talk to your OB about that. But most OBs will allow you to continue to do some form of exercise um, with some guidelines throughout most all trimesters. Um, reduces sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is the loss of muscle mass and function um, or strength. Uh, it is a normal part of aging. Muscle mass decreases approximately three to 8% per decade after the age of 30. That's kind of depressing. Um, and this rate of decline is even higher after the age of 60. And this leads to loss of function, lower metabolism, loss of mobility, and loss of independence. Um, none of the things that you want. Uh, muscle is a metabolic furnace. It burns about 35 to 50 calories a day compared to a measly two calories per pounds of fat. But the sad thing is, is that as our hormones change and as our activity level changes, and frequently as our diet changes, not always for the better, we end up kind of switching our body composition to more fat, less muscle. But exercise will help you make that sh shift in a more positive way. Um, weight training can counteract some of the muscle loss, but it will not stop sarcopenia completely. Um, but you're better off starting out with more muscle in your 20s and 30s. So anybody who's on uh, this webinar that's listened to this that's younger, now is your time. Start building, start building it up. Um, sorry. Yeah. Let me go back two slides. Um, decreases erectile dysfunction. So for my men on the call, there's that. Uh, creates relationships and community. I know that personally, I didn't always start out loving exercise. It has been a journey and process for me. Um, I would say I probably really bought in when I was about 38, 39. No, I was actually 39. Um, and I didn't buy in all at once. It was a very slow momentum <laughs> get going. And now I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it, but, um, but the community and relationships that I've built through, do, through exercising and workout groups has been amazing. And they are really close friends and it's, and I look forward to going to work out because I get to see my friends and have people that, that I know are enjoying the same thing or sometimes not enjoying it as much, but, um, but we're, we're all there in pain together, um, trying to work on our health and well being. So that's, that's a, that's a positive, uh, improved autophagy. Uh, autophagy is an intracellular housekeeping. Um, it sort of is a clean out of misshapen and misfolded proteins. Um, and it improves mitochondrial uh, function reduces the risk of multiple cancers and the recurrence of cancers. The 
this slide is from the uh, NIH, uh, National Cancer Institute data. And this is showing um, that there is strong evidence that the higher levels of physical activity are linked to a lower risk of several types of cancers. Um, you can see the statistics here. These are people, the percentage um, of lower cancer risk in those people who are highly active versus a group of people with the lowest activity in meta-analysis studies. So these are multiple studies, combined data. And as you can see, um, these aren't just low numbers. These are pretty significant. Um, and for several other cancers, there is more limited evidence of an association. These include certain cancers of the blood, as well as lung, pancreas, prostate, ovaries, thyroid, liver, and rectum. Um, exercise has many biological effects on the body. Um, and one of, many of those um, are attributed to this lower cancer risk. Some people think, well, if you're exercising, you have less obesity. If you have less obesity, then you know obesity is linked to cancers. Yes, that's true, but there's other metabolic pathways that, that occur uh, lowering levels of sex hormones uh, with exercise, and that would be pertinent in breast and colon cancer, um, preventing higher levels of insulin, which has been linked to the development of both breast and colon cancer decreasing inflammation, um, improving the immune system, um, decreasing exposure of the gastric, uh, gastrointestinal tract to suspected carcinogens, because if you're constipated, you're not detoxing. Um, sweating, the sweating of exercise is one way your body detoxes itself. That's important. Um, so, and of course, the obesity factor as well or even just increase visceral fat. So, here's a graphic that I really liked, and this came from the American Institute of Cancer Research. Um, and it kind of shows here, I have the different pretend people on the side, and it shows Joe, who's very active in the yellow all day long. He's at a sit-stand desk, he's walking, he's lifting things. You get the sense here. He's biking for leisure fun activity, and then he goes to bed. So he's very active. And he may, you know, the green is the actual exercise, but he's pretty active throughout the day. Um, and his cancer risk indicator is much lower. In contrast to the person here on the bottom who was very sedentary with the highest cancer risk, but there's a lot of good spots in between, um, you know, and there's a lot of, and one reason I like this graphic is because it kind of shows you the more active you are, even if you're doing that one hour of really intense workout, if you go and you just sit at home or at work the rest of the day, that you know, it, the, it didn't discount that one hour, that one hour absolutely 100% counts, but could you, could you do a sit-stand desk? Could you, you know, take your groceries into the house one bag at a time instead of trying to make fewer trips? Could you park further out in the parking lot? Could you take the stairs at work? Um, you know, could you walk the dog when you get home from work and make the dog happy? Um, so really making up for the rest of the sedentary time is important. And I think that's what this, this slide shows. Now this slide, slide is specifically about cancer, but you get the gist. So what about exercise for cancer survivors? Um, is it safe? Yes, there's strong evidence that moderate intensity training um, and or resistance exercise during cancer treatment can reduce fatigue, anxiety, depression, improve quality of life and physical functions, um, can help improve lymphedema in breast cancer patients, beneficial effects on survival of patients with breast, colorectal and prostate cancers. And those are just the ones that have the biggest data. Um, breast cancer survivors who were the most physically active had a 42% lower risk of death from any cause and a 40% lower risk of death from breast cancer than those who were the least physically active. Colorectal cancer, um, there's been multiple studies there. Um, and, you know, same with prostate. 
um, it's really, it's really powerful. Additional benefits of physical activity. Um, lower risk of all cause mortality. That's death, lower cause of death if you exercise and or become physical act, physically active. As we define the two are different. Exercise is a type of physical activity, but we're talking about the overall benefits of physical activity. Um, building community and connection, which I talked about my personal experience with that. It sets a healthy example for your children and other family members, because you can't really tell your kids they need to go outside and play and there's nobody outside, you know, it, you're sitting in the house. I mean, lead by example kind of thing. Um, increase self-confidence and self-esteem. I know that's been very, very true for me. And that's what made me think that this graphic was so funny. I'll give you a minute to read that. So, if physical activity has all these benefits and it's free, why not, as Nike says, just do it? Well, what are the roadblocks? Eh, I'm not motivated to do it. Um, well, it was interesting because as I was thinking about my talk today, I was also thinking about, um, I, I, I did go and exercise today in the same small group that I exercise in. And most of, they're all women. Most of the women are, I think our youngest is 38. It's a group of about six or seven. The oldest is in her mid sixties and we're everywhere in between. And after workout today, I said, what is everybody's motivation for working out today? Like, what, what is your, or not today, just in general, what is your motivation to work out? And my, the answers I got were really funny. One woman said, um, actually, I got three people that said for my mental health. So there's that. Um, I got one person who said so that I can still fit in my clothes because I don't want to have to buy new clothes. I got one person who I hadn't seen in a while and she showed up and she said, I don't have motivation. <laughs> I said, well, you, something got you here. Why are you here? And she said, well, COVID is why I'm here. I gained 17 pounds and I have to get this off. Okay. Um, and the most interesting answer that I got was um, because I have severe scoliosis and I had never noticed this because I'm not her physician. Um, because I have severe scoliosis. And if I didn't do this, I might not be able to walk or do things comfortably. And I've done this for 35 years and I don't, I don't know another way of life. It's like getting up and eating breakfast. I get up and exercise. And I thought that was amazing. It gave me a whole new level. And she actually is one of the oldest people in the class. So I thought that was very inspirational, but some people just aren't motivated. Time, time is a big player here. Um, a lot of people, when I say, you know, do you work out? No, I don't have time to do that. Um, so you have to find the time. You have to prioritize um, and carve out. And it doesn't matter. It can be just, just 15 minutes. I know that a couple of people at the Maxwell Clinic will go out and take a couple of laps around the building at lunch. I know a couple of others that do a couple of laps through the building going up and down the stairs just to get some movement in. So finding the time and making it work for your schedule. Weather, I know that sounds like a stupid one to put on there, but weather, a lot of people are like, well, I was doing good until it got cold. I understand that. I don't love to exercise in the cold either, but I also don't love to exercise when it's super hot. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a, uh, you know, it's an excuse and I'm guilty of using it as the next person. Um, but when it's raining, what's your backup plan? Um, have a friend that you can rely on and be like, Hey, you want to meet me at the mall? We'll be mall walkers today because it's torrential rain outside, but I don't want to miss my workout. Um, fear. 
that seems kind of like a silly one. Um, fear, people have a lot of fear about exercise. They're afraid they're going to get to the gym and not know what to do. They're going to feel embarrassed. They don't have the right clothes. They are fearful that they're going to be hurt. Um, they, you know, they're fearful that people will stare at them, um, you know, and they haven't worked out. They're not fit enough to be there. I've heard a lot of, um, I have personally felt in the past and also have heard from close friends and family um, and patients that those, those that fear is a big one. Cost, money, equipment. Um, you know, I can't afford to join the gym. I don't have any equipment at the house. If I only had this, I could do this. Oh, my bike has a flat tire, all the, all the things. You don't really need that much equipment to work out. In fact, you don't need any at all. There are a gazillion now body weight workouts online. Um, if you want to do a HIT, which is a high interval, high intensity interval training, you can go to YouTube and do HIT and stream it, you know, to your laptop or to your television. Um, you know, it, you look it up on Google. You can find lots of different videos for lots of different things. Um, and that's free. Um, kids and family. This is a big one for moms and even dads because, you know, we've got all the kids and I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm the like lowest one on the totem pole and speaking from a, being a mom of two boys who are now older, I went through that. I didn't do much at all when they were little. Um, and that's on me. I could have, I mean, it didn't feel like I could have, but in retrospect, I could have. Um, so finding the time, incorporating, getting creative, um, you know, I, frequently I see a group of moms doing like stroller walks and, you know, squats behind their strollers and doing different things to <clears throat> get out, have community and move their body. Um, so there's options there. Um, knowledge. I don't know what to do. That's legit. Um, you know, you, you can't be expected to know what to do. So seeking someone who does know what to do is an option for some people. It's not an option for everybody. If you can get a trainer, that's great. If you can't get a trainer, then, you know, watching tutorial videos online, again, free. Um, there's lots of options there. Fatigue. Um, again, if you are too tired to exercise, please speak to your um, clinician. That is super important um, because if you really are motivated and you just try and you you don't have the energy to do it then that may be something going on nutritionally or uh, with your uh, energy in a mitochondrial type way age oh I'm too old I can't do it well I'm kind of old myself and I don't feel that old because I do move and so I think you feel less old the more you move um there's a video in here that I will not play due to the sake of time, but I want to share the link with you so that you can watch that will speak to that. And thinking you can't. That's probably the absolute biggest one of all. Most people think they can't. I have thought that I can't do a lot of stuff that I have since done. And there's a lot of stuff that I probably think I can't do still, but um, it's, it's, a, it's almost mind over matter. Um, your body is the finest, most complex machine that you will ever own. It requires regular and consistent maintenance, just like your home or your car. So, you know, so what will it be? A Ferrari or a stock car? Um, I believe we all have the power to create health, no matter what our genetics are or life circumstances. Our bodies have innate universal intelligence. And if you give it what it needs each day, and it can and will repair itself. It's about the small choices that we make every day. Those choices seem insignificant in the moment, but they are so important long-term. So start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Each day, move more and play and add more years to your life and more life to your years. 
And when I said that about George, uh, when I said that about age, I was thinking of George. Now in preparation for this webinar, I was looking at a bunch of different things and found this article in Run Runner's World Online. Um, it is about George Etzweiler, who is 99 years old and he is still running races. Um, when I read the article, embedded in the article is a video, which I'm not going to play for the sake of time. If you're interested, I think this was in the, hold on just a second. This was in the May 2019 uh, Runner's World magazine, but if you just Google his name, halfway through um, the article, there is an embedded video and it actually made me teary when I watched it. He is the cutest man and he is just a true inspiration. He began running when he was 49 years old and he just kept going. So I encourage you to find your infer inspiration and focus on your goals and whatever you do, just be consistent. Thank you for your time and attention. And now I'm going to answer some questions. It looks like I have some. Sorry, this is, I've been looking over there. I have two screens and this uh, is the first webinar I've done with this format. So bear with me here, folks. Let's see. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Okay, I have a question. Um, it says, I have recently begun yoga class with a one-on-one -on -one teacher starting at the beginning. How will this work for weight loss, muscle movement, and muscle improvement, and how should I include more vigorous exercise? Um, this is a great, great question. Um, Yoga is an amazing practice and it will absolutely, most people think of yoga as being meditative, stretchy, and you can find classes that are very meditative and stretchy. Um, and those are all very important things, but there have been yoga classes where I have like been drenched in sweat and it was not a hot yoga where I was working. I was building muscles. There's a lot of planks involved. There's a lot of core work. Um, there's a lot of balance and muscle strength. So that is, that's really huge. So, so that's awesome. Um, including more vigorous exercise. I would start with walking. I mean, I don't know you, so I don't know what your conditions are, but most everybody can start somewhere. Just start by moving around more, um, simple things. Um, you know, if you can walk in your neighborhood, take a loop around the block. If you can do it, then the next day to two, two loops. Um, if time is an issue, then walk a little faster. Just do, you know, and increase it from, you know, little bits by little bits because nobody starts out like running a marathon. I mean, it, it's, it's hard. You have to, you have to build up. And I would recommend that if anybody on this call is, I'm hoping inspired or at least educated by, by what, what I talked about today is that you, that you just start something. I mean, just just move more throughout the day and then take that to the next level by, you know, walking. You don't need equipment for walking. Um, so, um, and then looking into things, um, you know, like high intensity interval training, that can be pretty intense. You can watch some videos online and if you're like, oh no, I can't do that. I do recommend that you um, get somebody to kind of, you know, watch your form and make sure and, you, and that can be somebody that's in your house like am I doing what they're doing on the screen do, do I look like that um be careful who you ask because you don't want somebody to be critical um but but that's that's important um second question is functional training compared to other exercise um I am all about the functional training because the um and let me, let me explain what functional training is. Functional training is doing movements that we would do in our life. Like in other words, I think a air squat is a great functional movement because we all have to get up out of a chair. 
Um, and that's important. Um, so I'm not gonna go through exercises here cause this is not really the purpose of this, but I am, I really am a fan of functional exercise. Functional exercise is a mimic of exercise that you do in daily life. So, you know, shoveling, you know, the move, you know, that kind of, that kind of movement, that's a functional exercise. Um, you know, if anybody's ever tried to dig a hole in Tennessee, we have a lot of clay and it will get your heart rate up. Um, so that's, you know, but there's also functional movements that you can do in the gym. There is a wonderful um, trainer. He doesn't live here anymore. His name is Garrett McLaughlin. And my boys who are now in their 20s used to, he used to train kids and young athletes, but he, he has an amazing set of videos that are very targeted, explaining everything. And he does a full functional um, training evaluation of different parts and you can Google him. Um, and I will have them add this to the, to the video for the rewatching. I don't know how that, how they do that, but I'll have somebody send you that information, um, or put it available out there, but he's, he's great. He doesn't live here anymore, so you can't go see him, but he does do a lot of online videos. Um, and how important is, uh, heart rate target. If you are, I think that that is important, but I am not a person who likes to, you know, track that. I don't have a wearable. Um, a lot of people do. Um, and there are certain uh, gyms that really train to that heart rate, like Orange Theory locally. Um, they, you know, try to get you in the zone. Um, and it depends on if you're trying to, to train for something. Um, that's important. If you're also trying to hit a cardiovascular you know, point, that's also very uh, important. But for the most part, I'm not real big on having people check their heart rate. I, most people don't want to fool with the numbers. They mostly just want to, you know, know, is this, am I doing enough? And I think if you're getting that vigorous exercise where you're like, if you're walking and your whole gig is you're just walking around the block all the time, and that's great. That's awesome. But could you change it? Could you add heels? Could you add stairs? Could you go faster? Could you maybe run a little bit and do, you know, an interval training where you run for a minute and then you walk for two minutes and then you, you know, run for another minute and you walk for two minutes. Um, and so I've never, and I guess that's my bias because I have never um, done a target heart rate, uh, but I know a lot of people are really big on that. And I think that is all the questions we had for today. So um, thank you guys for attending. And um, this will be recorded. You can go back and watch it if you need to. Um, and I will um, look forward to seeing some of you guys in clinic. <laughs>